and welcome to Woman Vision TV. It's where women talk. I'm your host, Nadia Giordana, and my guest today is Deborah Delaney. Deborah is the founder and CEO of Touching Lives Adult Day Services. She's here to talk with us about some of the things you should be thinking about if you're planning to uh, make the decision to become a caregiver for an elderly friend or family member. Let's talk with Deborah. Deborah, welcome. I'm so glad you could be on the show today. Oh, I'm honored, Nadia. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Well, it's good to have you here. Why don't you start by telling me a little bit about you and what you do? Sure. Um, I, Deborah Delaney, as, as we discussed, and I provide adult day services and in-home health to uh, 18 years and older. Mm -hmm. um, primarily into the aging services is basically where we're focused. Um, but our youngest is uh, 22 years old. And what we do, which how we separate ourselves, is that we really focus on people's traditions and values and preferences in life. Mm -hmm because um, over the 12 years, I have found out that aging can be one of the most disrespected journeys in life, yeah. and it's just truly unfortunate, and we're out to change that. I come from corporate. I have managed um, North America with Siemens, a $128 million division. I have done a pre-IPO company, um, taking them from 500000 to $9 million in three years, and mm -hmm. so I said, you know, I think I want to create my own business. I'm ready, and that was 12 years ago. That was 12 years ago. Yeah. Well, it's doing well, hasn't it? It, it, it you know, it's been a challenge. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I was hope, hoping that it would have taken off a little faster than it did, but now that the the fastest growing market is what I invested in, is finally happening here um, with the aging uh, journey. So. I think what um, I've learned a lot is coming from corporate and doing small business. Mm -hmm. um, I loved my corporate stint. I was 20 years with Siemens, IBM, and um, I wouldn't trade a small business in for the world. It's yeah. really, it's, you really get an opportunity, especially in this business, to feel like you're doing some philanthropy type of work mm -hmm. because you're helping families. And you really do. Yeah. yeah. And you're keeping people in their homes and communities as long mm -hmm. as possible. Well, let's talk about the challenges facing our country right now as this current population of baby boomers gets older and older and moves into the age where they're going to be needing care. What does that landscape look like? Well, currently right now, if we were adding as many children to the school network daily as we are adding the aging population, we would need 1,200 new classrooms a day. Mm -hmm. So it's the fastest growing market. And, and positively, there's lots of opportunities for people. Yeah. But what I believe the state of Minnesota has done is a great job on addressing aging well before the, um, the boom has happened. Uh, but it changes the landscape. It is the biggest social revolution in Years, years. Uh, we will have more school-age children, excuse me, more aging um, population than school-age children by 2020 for the next 30 years. So w what do we do? We, you know, do we create dementia type of communities? You know, how do we keep people in their home and community? And then how do we help the caregivers? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people don't want to put their loved ones in long-term care. Yeah, and uh, that's some of the things that uh, have uh, happened in our family and things we've had to think about. What are some of the things to consider if someone is making plans to become a caregiver for a friend or a family member? Well, the first thing I, I share with families is own the journey. Mm -hmm. Own the journey. So if you have a plan that you never want to put your loved one in a long-term care facility or nursing home, then own that journey and plan out, uh, you know, relatively um, early yeah. in, in the stages because it can hit you in a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. you, your loved one can fall down the stairs, mm -hmm. hit their head, next thing you know, you have a traumatic brain injury, now what do you do? So mm -hmm. own the journey if you plan to be that caregiver. And own your aging journey. 
if you're capable, plan that out. What is it, what is it that you want to have happen with your aging journey? You know, do you want to um, prepare so that your children can keep you home mm -hmm. and in your community as long as possible, therefore you get long-term care insurance, or you do the appropriate things to help that? Um, as far as caregiving goes, even once you hit that caregiving stage and you may not have planned for it, again, own the caregiving uh, journey. I share with families all the time that come into our center that there, there's two different roles a caregiver plays. One is the spouse or the adult child mm -hmm. or the partner, yeah. and the other is the caregiver. So for instance, if somebody was coming to the center, their loved one is coming to the center, and they're sometimes just like children, they wake up, I have a tummy ache, I don't want to go. <laughs> the uh, spouse would say, okay, honey, it's okay, you can stay home. The caregiver would say, no, you need to go. Yeah. By the way, they have a nurse there, and the nurse can check you out because I need my day. And, and we can't afford to have caregivers get sick because once that happens, then the crisis is really hit and escalates. Oh, yeah, and, and it does happen. Oh, oh I've seen it. Uh, 12 absolutely. years I've seen a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what about, let's say uh, your parents, it's, it's almost always our parents, the parents, mm -hmm. in-laws like that, who are elderly, driving, and shouldn't be driving anymore and don't want to give that up. Now, in the case of our family, we lucked out. My father has always been, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's a few mm -hmm. years ago, so he made yeah, a few plans ahead of time. And we are going through that journey and, and uh, accepting what's coming along. What was interesting was, as stubborn a man as he was mm -hmm. in his entire life, he totally surprised us by accepting the inevitable. While he still had his faculties, he made a lot of prearrangements uh, that uh, helped us out, gave us uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the approval that we could go ahead and override his decisions and he gave up his car keys something we never thought he would do and usually they don't what do you do when they don't want to give up those car keys well first of all let me compliment your father because he mm -hmm. owned the journey yeah he accepted it. I'm, I'm he's I mean that's remarkable big difference. you, you big know difference. we see more of the opposite oh yeah yeah um, y y you know Losing your independence and your sense of purpose, it, it, it's just, it's just sad, mm -hmm. you know, it's sad. Um, there's many little tricks of the trade, you know, sometimes it's a slow process. You, I've instructed and shared with families of stories that I've heard that you get different set of keys and all of a sudden it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, geez, honey, I, I don't know why it doesn't work. And that I'll, you know, let me use my keys. I'll drive. Okay, yeah. so you kind of slowly but surely yeah. do little things. Get them used to, to riding with you. Exactly. Okay. Get them used to all of a sudden. What happened to my keys? And you know, I don't know. I'll go, I'll go to the car dealership and find out. And typically, with the disease, you know, that short-term memory, they're not going to remember. Yeah. Okay. That's just one. And we start accepting those. Yes. Things. The other thing too is that, like the Courage Center, um, places that are great facilities, do testing, mm -hmm. and they can. Um, you know, give you an outcome of a test that says you, you can't drive anymore. You mm -hmm. get your doctors involved and mm -hmm. say, look, you can't. And that's hard. And in males, it's yeah. super hard. Very tough. Very tough situation. Um, I am a five-year cancer survivor, breast cancer. And well, congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, it's a big milestone for me. Mm -hmm. But I had chemo brain, um, and I worked the whole time. And I lost my memory with chemo brain, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I get it. My, my lovely daughter, Caitlin, was at that time working with me. That and would be scary. I was, I totally get what they feel. Mm -hmm. I love my business, but I even felt more in love with it yeah. because I could understand that population. The difference is mine came back, but I lost my keys. I missed appointments and I would have to mask it or I would have to feel indignant because I missed an appointment and call and say, I'm so sorry, I'm on chemo. But... To know that it will never come back, mm -hmm. you know, it's just it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. And at the early stages of these diseases, and it could be anything, you know something's going wrong. You know it. And mm -hmm. you just look at them with your just warm heart and say, we're here to help. Mm -hmm. 
you know, let's put a plan in place. And that's what's sad, is to, that they watch these individuals lose their sense of purpose. And that's what we're all about. We create that sense of purpose. If I have to create a desk because he was uh, uh, executive, I create a desk. Mm -hmm. You know, we've done that many times. And that independence, you know, getting from point yeah. A to point B. Of course, that's where we come in to be there to help with that and the other methods, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And there's so many resources out there. That, that families can use. And especially in Minnesota with our you know region and Swedish and German, I can do it, I don't need help. <laughs> I can do it, I don't need help. Well, guess what, yeah. you need help. Yeah. And don't be afraid to ask. And I see that so much with families. Uh, they're just so embarrassed to go and ask. Yeah. No, they're there. The resources are there in that continuum of care. And there's many, many, many people that will support volunteers, uh, programs through the government. There's just so much out there that people don't know about. And I think these type of programs that you're doing really helps those individuals feel okay to go ask for help. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Well, what about, let's say you're in a position where you're really considering becoming the primary caregiver mm -hmm. for an elderly parent as I said, usually is. What are some of the additional things that person has to think about before taking on such a monumental responsibility? The number one thing I, I share with people is, can you maintain your lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Okay. Will you be able to continue to go to your exercise programs? Can you continue to work? Can you go to your doctor's appointments? And if any of those questions are no, then you have to say, what resources can I bring in to maintain my quality of life? Because we can't afford to have you sick. Yeah, it would be really hard for a person to do it all alone. Oh, and yeah. most of them do. When you yeah. look at spousals or partners, they're, they're alone. Kids could be in different, their children mm -hmm. could be in different states and they feel guilty. Mm -hmm. But first and most importantly, ask yourself, how do I maintain my lifestyle without jeopardizing my health and my family? Mm -hmm. Once you figure out that, and it's a list-driven Oh yeah, and there process, will be sacrifices. There's going to be sacrifices. You know, there's, a, there's a limit to what you can do and maintain for Absolutely. yourself. Sure. And then I, I share with families, take a look at home and community-based services first before you decide any type of placement. Mm -hmm. Because it's less expensive, and once they're placed, and typically when it gets to that crisis level, they're going into long-term care, -term care mm -hmm. which is a locked facility. Yeah. And it's a whole different ballgame. That's just a whole different ballgame. Yeah. It's appropriate at its time. And mm -hmm. like I share with families, you'll know. You'll yeah. know when it's time. Yeah. But if you don't feel that, don't do it. Use your home and community-based services first. And let's say a family waits too long and, for example, you get a fall, an injury, a stay in the hospital, then you have rehab, and then a frantic search because you know this person's not going to get better, it's not going to get better enough, and then you're looking for long-term care. How do you avoid falling into that situation so suddenly? Well, first of all, the hospitals and the transitional care units cannot discharge you without a plan. Mm. That's a law, okay. legal. A lot of families don't know that going in. No, no. So, um, you know, there are families that, that are proactive and look at the resources before, you know, they're, while they're in there. But the social workers that are in those facilities have to work with the families to determine the right placement and the right solutions and offer suggestions. Mm -hmm. So Adult Day, we at Touching Lives um, is a true medical social model. Um, there's adult day and there's adult day, okay? So what we do, we do chronic care management. So we take people with uh, feeding tubes, trachs, uh, Hoyer lifting, and all of that because we try to keep them in their home. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have those, that, the capability of utilizing those resources within your home, then you can look at adult days or in-home care that offers that type of support. So now we're keeping at home, but they cannot discharge a patient until they have a, a, a plan in place. But it's up to the caregiver as well to reach out to other resources. They, yeah. you know, they, the social worker, you know, keep in mind how busy they are. Mm -hmm. They may say, oh, you know, right away memory care or right away assisted living, and that might not be the best solution. Well, it's what they know, and like exactly. you say, they are busy. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So 
Um, again, seek out resources. You know, there are so many um, facilities that they can call. You can call the government. The, the Department of Human Services has a ton of information on their website. Um, the Department of Health, who license in-home care. There, all kinds of uh, facility listings are on those websites. They can call. And I saw on your website you had a list of resources which yeah. I will put some of those on the screen at the end of this oh, segment great. so that uh, people have quick access to that from off of your That's website. wonderful, guys. I try to keep adding because there's new, there's, um, there's always, you know, resources coming in. And there's caregiver organizations, caregiverminnesota.org. I mean, there's just so support much. Support groups, too, so I would assume. We offer a support group the second Wednesday of every month, and oh, it's wonderful. Okay. You know, from, it doesn't have to be just our families. People come from all over. There, it, there's... The Alzheimer's um, organization um, has a tremendous amount of listings, so the resources are there. Good. And, you know, I've been hearing stories about people who've gone into assisted living and loved it. Oh, yeah. And that tells me that it's not really or not necessarily such a bad thing. Am I right? And is this, would that be a way to transition if the prognosis is that the eventuality will be long-term care. Absolutely. Um, there's a place and time for assisted living. Some, it could be sooner and it could be later. Mm -hmm. you, you know, with assisted living, um, it, again, it, it's an expensive solution, but it can also be the right solution. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there is just no way that that family can take care of a loved one, have them move in, or have resources go to that person's home. And so for them to feel really safe for their loved one, they'll yeah. have them go to assisted living. And many of the in the assisted livings will then um, transition into the memory care unit. Yeah, that's okay. what I was thinking. But but also it's assisted living. So they're so it's menu driven. Mm -hmm. So you have to pick the the Okay. So yeah. you may go in for a certain amount, but then all of a sudden your mom and dad or your loved one needs more care, so now you're paying for that. Yeah. So it's all menu-driven. So um, Without having to move, though, that's kind of nice for the, for the resident, isn't it? Up to right. a certain point. Up to a certain yeah. point, that yeah. is correct. A lot yeah. of times, um, you know, I have families tell me that um, they've shared their concerns sometimes with some of these facilities that they try to keep them in the assisted living as long as possible before they transition. Um, it could be cost driven, it could be just maybe they don't have the memory care unit open and so it becomes very expensive because mm -hmm. they need a lot of care. So, you know, it's just, there's always an appropriate time for yeah. all of these continuum of care resources. One's not better than the other, it, it comes down to what do you own in your journey and what do you want to do as a caregiver. That sounds right, yeah. Well, we're running out of time, but uh, is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to talk about before we say goodbye? Yes, I would like to make sure that people realize that we all age differently. Mm -hmm. We all have our own traditions. I have a different tradition than you have. A, mm -hmm. a, you do. So when you're seeking out resources, make sure that you inquire and and tell people that you want these certain traditions and values and preferences in life sure. supported. So if my loved one wants to pray five times a day and your the medication administration has to wait 10 minutes, that's okay. If I want to have my assisted living, uh, my mom and dad's assisted living painted in, you know, Irish colors, mm -hmm. then allow that because that's where it's going. Yeah, That's where it's going. And if you can't do that, then I wouldn't go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use any of the resources. The more like home you can make it, the better off. You bet. Do I feel free? Do I feel like I, you know, that sense of purpose? Deborah, thank you no, so thank much you. for being here today. Thanks. This was great. Oh, thank and you. And thank for you for watching. And we'll post some resources on the screen at the end of this segment. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks again.
baked beans. Not long ago, I found a 100 year old plus recipe in my late mother-in-law's recipe box. It was for baked beans and it involved soaking the beans overnight, using salt, pork, and simmering and cooking the beans all day long. It was great. Well, I'm not cooking that way for you today. I found a better way and actually a little more flavorful and tastier than the original old-fashioned way of uh, making baked beans. I took about six slices of bacon. Actually, in this case, I used three slices of bacon and a little bit of ham. And because you can use bacon, ham, or bacon and ham as I'm doing here today. I cooked the bacon and after that I let this pan cool for a minute. Mo removed with paper towels about half that bacon fat. It's just too much. I put a little olive oil in here and now I'm going to move on with the recipe. Doesn't need to be quite that hot. And first thing that goes in there is a, an onion, one large onion, chopped. I'll get the onion sauteing. This needs to be done just until it uh, starts to turn translucent. It takes a few minutes. And I'm going to wait with the garlic. Let this go for just a minute before we add the garlic in and get the onions ready to go. It's going to be the onions, then a little bit of garlic, then I will add the canned pinto beans. This is 30 ounces, a 30 ounce can. You can use two 14, 15 ounce cans with the juices. That's important, with the juices. So those are the first three things that will go into this fat. long, two or three minutes. I think this preliminary step, maximum of about five minutes. Put the garlic in. One clove of garlic. There wasn't any garlic in the original old-fashioned recipe. And there wasn't any brown sugar, which I'll put in in a minute, too. That's, that's something I took from my own mother. She always puts brown sugar in her baked beans. Okay, now the onions are there. I will add the canned pinto beans with their juices. to mix. This is going to be so good. Next comes either a quarter or a third. This happens to be a third cup of ketchup. That just depends on your taste. It doesn't make much difference either way. and two tablespoons of Dijon mustard. That also was not in the original recipe. It's something I always like to put in my beans. This, a quarter cup of molasses, was in the original recipe, and I think it's essential. simmering just a little bit more and mixed a little bit.
brown sugar, as I mentioned. And here's something that I always add, and this is one of my things. This is a teaspoon of dried onion flakes or dried minced onion, either or. And the reason I put that in, I wouldn't call this an optional ingredient at all. I always include this because even though we have fresh onion in this recipe, the dried onion adds a dimension that you can't get any other way. I love it. I always include it. I think it's part of what makes this recipe particularly good. All right, all those things are in here. A little salt, a little pepper, and that's just to your taste. You can add that a little bit more later if you want. And then I add back the uh, bacon and or ham. Turn this down just to simmer just for a minute or two. I I have the oven heating at 375 degrees. It's already at temperature. I'm transferring this to an oven safe dish. If you're going to take this recipe anywhere, you'll need to double it. This is going into the oven now and it will cook at 375 degrees for about 45 minutes until the moisture is reduced so you leave it uncovered you don't need this cover until after it's cooked uh, cook this for about 45 minutes until it's reduced and thicker and getting browned and sticking to the edges of the dish around the edges I'll put this into the oven now And we'll take a look at this when it's finished. Here we go. Can you see that? It looks gorgeous. Bubbling, browning around the edges. And it is done.